All right, here we go. So equilibrium. All right, so real quick. Um, so we've already talked a number of times about center of mass, right? And we learned that, like, guys, back to We learned that, like, we did that problem with the meter stick, meter stick tipping over, right? We talked about the fact that to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy, you measure the height of the center of mass, right? Okay, so we've done some of this before. Um, next chapter, when we get to gravitation, I'll talk specifically about why center of mass and center of gravity are not exactly the same. But in any sort of 99% of the problems you're going to see, the center of mass and center of gravity are so close that the difference is insignificant. Okay? Um, so, um, I guess the, the main thing that I want to point out here is that in the same way that we've been doing, um, when you've got an object that is, you know, that's got some sizable size to it, that's a terrible sentence. I'm going to stick with it though. You've got some sizable size. Uh, when you draw in your force of gravity, you always draw that force of gravity as originating at the center of mass. Okay? And you'll see why that becomes important in a minute. All right? Now, um, so. Man, I rearranged some of these slides and I, like 10 seconds ago, realized that I probably jumped the gun here. All right, so the whole point of today's uh, lecture is we're going to be learning about what's called static equilibrium. All right, so here's what it means for an object to be in static equilibrium. All right, if an object is in static equilibrium, it means there is no linear acceleration, which means that your net force is zero. And there's no angular acceleration, which means that your net torque is zero. Okay? So really, that's all this chapter is about. It's about solving problems in which these two things are true. Cool? All right. Now, it turns out that there are a couple different types of static equilibrium. All right? Let me embiggen this slide here so that we can, oops, that's not what I want to do. View, dual page, off. All right, so it turns out that there are three different types of static equilibrium, all right? There's what's called stable equilibrium, neutral equilibrium, and unstable equilibrium, okay? Occasionally, you'll see these terms down here, neutral, static, and dynamic. Okay, I really like this little slide here because it gives you a pretty good appreciation for what they are. All right, so an object is said to be in neutral equilibrium if giving it a gentle nudge one way or the other doesn't raise or lower the center of gravity. Right, if this little ball here, the center of mass is right at the center, right? If I give it a little nudge, is the center of gravity going to move up or down at all? No. Okay, whereas here, this is sometimes you'll see this called static equilibrium. I really Usually, people would call this stable equilibrium. All right, and the reason it's called stable is because if you give it a little nudge, you have to raise the center of gravity, right? And when you let go of it, what's going to happen? It's going to roll back to where it was, right? So it's sort of self-correcting, right? Okay, so for that reason, this is usually referred to as stable equilibrium, whereas this one is called unstable because if I give it a gentle nudge, What's it going to do? It's going to fall down. It's not self-correcting, right? Okay. Notice the type of equilibrium that the object is in is you can't just say, oh, I've got a ball. That's automatically in a certain type of equilibrium, right? It depends on the circumstances of the object. All right. So another simple example I could give you is if I grab a meter stick. So right now, this meter stick is in stable static equilibrium because a gentle nudge, and it automatically self-corrects itself, right? So that's stable equilibrium. This is unstable equilibrium because a gentle nudge will make it tip over, right? And so your center of gravity there is going down, right? Follow? What's the only way that I could put it in neutral equilibrium? Put it on the ground. Oh, okay, yeah, put it on the ground flat, actually, that works. Actually, that's, putting it flat on the ground is actually stable. 
Because the only way you could give it a gentle nudge is to lift the center of gravity, right? I guess you could push it to the side. But usually that's... Yeah, usually it's assumed that you're trying to make it rotate in some fashion. So, so yeah, so that was what I was looking for, was if you pivot it right at the center of mass, that's neutral equilibrium. Cool? Mm -hmm. Because now if I tip it, right? Okay, so questions with that? All right, so let's not get too bogged down with that. That might be one multiple choice question. So there you go. Neutral, stable, unstable. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so um, most of what you need to be able to do here is be able to use those two ideas of net force and net torque equaling zero. You need to be able to use those to solve problems, okay? Now, we did some of these teeter-totter problems last year. In fact, this, I think, is almost exactly an example from your notes from last year, okay? So I'm going to plow through this first example. Um, but I want to point out a super, 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 super important thing, all right? And then we're going to look at some more complicated examples, all right? So here we go. So this is like the classic, you know, like first uh, torque problem that most physics teachers would begin with. I upped the difficulty level a little bit here by giving the board some mass and putting the fulcrum not at the center, but... All right, so let's draw this. So here we go. So it says, suppose a teeter-totter consists of a 20-kilogram board of uniform density, which is 4 meters long. So let's draw it. Here's our board. You should be following along, please. There's your 4-meter long board. Um, it's uniform, so I'm going to go ahead and mark my center of mass. I always use an X to mark the center of mass. Okay, because X marks exactly. Cool. Um, ultimately, I'm going to be interested in the forces on this board. So I'm going to go ahead and take that 20 kilograms and convert it to force of gravity. Okay, so here's my force of gravity acting on the board. 20 times 9.8 gives you 196 newtons. Follow? All right. So the idea is, if this was it, and I just pivoted it at this end, that force of gravity would produce a torque and cause the board to tip over this way, right? Yep. Like the ducks, right? Okay, if I pivot it at this end, you're going to get a torque the other way, and it'll fall that way, right? All right, uh, let's see. The fulcrum is 1.5 meters from the end. So I always draw a little triangle to represent the fulcrum. Um, cool, let's see. Sally, who has a mass of 60 kilograms, sits at the short end. So here's Sally. 60 kilograms, so the force of Sally is 60 times 9.8 is 588 newtons. Uh, Roy wants to balance the board. All right, so A says make a free body diagram of the board. Uh, oh, shit, I forgot to move this. Roy's mass is 80 kilograms. Oh, which way is positive? So we'll come back to that in one second. All right, so let's do this. So the idea is here's Roy. I know that his force of gravity... Oops, sorry, I wanted to label that FR. Force of Roy. So 80 times 9.8 is 784 newtons. Cool? I'm going to put a little question mark over him because I don't know where he's going to go. I know he's going to go on the board somewhere. I just don't know where. Follow? Yeah. All right, what other forces are there? The force of the fulcrum, right? Okay, so A says make a free body diagram of the board. So one of the things you need to think about when you do these equilibrium problems is remembering that if it's an equilibrium, your net force is zero. Oh, so I ought to be able to find the force of the fulcrum, shouldn't I? Right? Because my net force has got to be zero, right? Think, Question, Peter? Isn't that just all the, like, forces that we added up? Yeah, basically. So in terms of forces, we've got three negative forces, right? So these forces are kind of downward, right? Oh, I wanted that to be red. So these forces are downward. Okay, so then I would go, oh, well, I know that my net force is the force of Sally plus the force of gravity plus the force of Roy plus the force of the fulcrum, and I know those have to add up to zero. And I get it, I'm being a little bit, you know, whatever. There's, you, you don't need to write all this garbage out, but as the problems get more complicated, thinking about it in these terms will make your life easier. Okay? So net force is zero. Force of Sally is negative 588. Force of gravity is negative 196. Force of Roy is negative 784. Plus the force of the fulcrum. Solvify it, and you will discover that the force of the fulcrum is 1526, 1562, 
something, something, be something. I have it written down on this piece of paper. 1568. I was right. It was something, something, be something. All right. I, I might add next to something there. All right. Everybody good? All right. So that thing. So force of the fulcrum is 1568 newtons. Good. Question? I don't want to jump ahead, but if, for example, like if the fulcrum was at the center of mass and you wanted to find the force of the fulcrum, you'd still have to include gravity. Right? Correct. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You want to always, so make sure you guys, when you do this, you have to consider all of the forces every time. Okay. All right. Questions on what I've done so far? All right. So now what we want to do is we want to figure out where Roy needs to sit. So I've already established the fact that the net force is zero and used that to solve for a thing. All right, what's the other thing that I know has to be true about the board? The net torque has got to be zero, right? Because there's not more torque one way or the other, so it's balanced, right? There's no angular motion, right? So my net torque is zero. Okay, cool. So, but when you talk about net torque, you have to identify a pivot point, right? So where's our pivot point, you guys? At the fulcrum, right? Totally. All right, so I'm going to label it. I'm going to put a little blue dot there, and I'm going to label it P for pivot point. Right? And that makes sense, because if it's balanced, then there should be no rotation around that pivot point, right? Follow? All right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an equation that says that the net torque about that pivot point is zero. Follow? All right, so. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do, darn it. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, so here we go. So I'll do it in blue. So our net torque around pivot point P, notice my notation. I put a little sub P there to indicate where my pivot point is and it corresponds with my drawing, all right? So that's got to equal the torque from Sally plus the torque from the fulcrum plus the torque from the gravity on the board plus the torque from Roy once he gets on the teeter totter. Follow? All right, now, this is a thing that I remember was a little bit confusing last year. So here's my recommendation. I'm going to write out all of my equations for torque, like force times distance, and I'm going to not worry about any signs. Okay, I'll put them in, but not at the start. I think the way, I don't know if you guys remember, I taught you guys last year that if it was to the left, to make the distance negative, and if it was to the right, make it positive. Yeah, but that ended up causing us problems when we had a vertical axis. Okay, so you really need to, the sign, let me say this, look. The sign on your force does not always correspond to the sign on your torque, right? Like, so with this pivot point, let me finish my train of thought and I'll get you. All right, so look, if I push down over here, that's a negative force. Is my torque positive or negative, you guys, from your perspective? That's positive, right? So I've got a downward force, but clockwise torque, right? Don't worry about you, don't worry about me, right? Do you guys agree? All right, but over here, a downward force makes, gives you negative force, right? Okay, so the sign on the force doesn't correspond to the sign on the torque, okay? And what I told you guys last year was, well, if you keep track of your distance also, that corrects it, but the problem is as soon as you go vertical, that falls apart, okay? So moral of the story is you need to sort of, I don't know how to like mentally just think, all right, is this thing going to make my get the, the object spin clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay? And I'll show you how we resolve all that in a minute. Um, oh, and actually, this will work out perfectly for what I'm trying to show you. I'm glad I made the drawing this way. Peter, you had a question seven hours ago, and I told you to wait a minute. Uh, is this, I was just about to ask if we were going to do clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, yes. So we're going we're gonna to stick with clockwise is negative. All right, so let's solve this thing. So what does my net torque have to be, you guys? Zero. Let's see, torque from Sally. So that's going to be her force times her distance. Oh, I didn't draw any of my distances in, did I? Darn it. All right, well, let's do that. Let's see. So we know that this is one and a half meters, 
right, to the fulcrum. The pivot point, I'm sorry, the center of mass is at the center, so this little distance here is 0.5 meters. And then this distance from the center of mass to the end is another 2 meters. I guess you don't really need that, but. Oh, I'm correct. All right, everybody good? Okay, so here we go. So let's solve this thing. So, um, so torque of Sally, that's going to be her force, 588, times her distance, which is 1.5. Do I need to worry about any angles here? No, because my force and my lever arm are already perpendicular, yes? Everybody good? All right. Plus the torque from the fulcrum, which is 1568 times zero. zero. Right? Does everybody see why that's zero? Plus the torque from gravity, which is 196 times 0.5 plus the force from Roy, which is 784 times D. And I'm going to put a little P here to indicate that that's the distance from my pivot point P. Clear? All right, so solve this. So bear with me here, you guys. I want to point something out, and this will hopefully help you guys understand a little bit better what's going on with the signs. So if you algebra all of this, here's what you get. You get 784 times the distance from the pivot point equals, and it gives you negative 784. All right? Now, remember, if you divide, that gives you a distance of negative 1, right? So does that mean that it goes to the left? No. Right? I mean, just like common sense, he's got to sit on the other side, right? Follow? All right. So remember, the signs on your forces and distance do not bear any correlation to the sign on your torque. What this is telling me is that the torque from Roy has to be negative, therefore clockwise. So which direction is Roy's force going to be? Down. So where do I have to put him on my, on my board to create clockwise torque? On the other side, okay? So my D is actually one meter to the right of my pivot point. So I don't know how you want to write that. One meter from the pivot point on the opposite side of Sally or whatever. So one meter to the right of the fulcrum. Yeah, Adam. Does it really matter... Um which side you make positive or negative as long as you specify which side of the board like the torque is on. So there, there's a lot going on with that question. Uh, um, no, so the, the reason I'm hesitating so much is I don't want you to think of one side being positive and the other side being negative. I'd rather have you thinking Clockwise is either positive or negative, and counterclockwise is the opposite. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because just because a force is on the left side doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to spin counterclockwise. Because I could have a force on this side that's up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But in like this case where all the forces are down. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I mean... Uh, any sign conventions we pick are arbitrary. Do you know what I mean? Like picking clockwise is negative is arbitrary. Yeah. Picking down is negative is arbitrary. You know, so whatever. As long as you're consistent with your signs, you're good. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Everybody good? All right. Now, any questions on what we just did here? All right. We're going to solve this again to make a point. All right. And if you only get one thing out of today's lesson, this is the thing I want you to get. When you've got an object that is in static equilibrium, and we say that that torque is zero, it doesn't matter where you choose your pivot point. The net torque is zero around any pivot point. All right. In this problem, I said, where's our pivot point? And every one of you right away just went, oh, the fulcrum. Because conceptually, that sort of makes sense, right? Like if the teeter-totter is going to teeter, 
it's going to teeter about the fulcrum, right? But if it's balanced, then it's not pivoting around this point, but it's also not pivoting around this point, or 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 this point, or, this point, or any point along its length. So you can literally pick, if you know the thing is in static equilibrium, you can pick any point along the length of the object and say that the net torque around that pivot point is zero. Okay? Which is huge. It opens up a ton of problem solving uh, strategies. All right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to solve this again, but I'm going to choose a different pivot point. All right? So are there any questions on what I did here in blue before I go on and do that? When yeah. you're doing the sum of the torques, you don't have to worry about the signs at all for that. Oh, shoot. Because I thank you. I'm so yeah. glad you just asked this. I, was, I, was I totally overlooked the thing. Yeah, thank you. The gravity. The torque due to gravity. Here's what I didn't do. I'm sorry. Um, damn it. Super damn it. All right, that's okay. My answer's right. I just I skipped some of the work. All right? So, look, you guys. Remember, I, I went through this whole thing where I said, don't worry about the signs. All right? What I also said was, then you need to go back in and, and think about if your torques are clockwise or counterclockwise. And I didn't do that. So I jumped ahead on my work. So let's do this here. So that force there, this 588 newtons, is that just that force, which this blue point is my pivot point, is this 588 newtons going to make the board spin clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. Is there anybody who doesn't see why that's true? We're good? All right, so that means that that is a positive torque. Okay? The next one is zero, so we don't need to worry about that. This one, 196. Let's take a look at this guy. So let's see, 196. So this force... With this pivot point, which way is that going to make the board spin? Clockwise or counter? Clockwise. That one's clockwise, right? Ah, and clockwise is negative. So this should have been a negative torque. Good. And then this one is my unknown. So leave it unknown. Okay? In this one, it's fairly obvious that, that she needs to produce more torque this way. But it won't always be. So let the math do the work for you. Leave this positive. Do the math and discover that your torque is negative, and then use that to figure out where the thing goes. Clear? I'm so glad you asked that, Josh. That was a huge oversight on my part. I was so excited about it. All right. Are we good? All right. Any questions? Okay. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to do the same thing, but with a different pivot point. And there's instructional value to this, so it's not just me trying to be a pain in your ass. Is everybody good before I go on? Okay, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to choose a different pivot point. So let's choose the net torque around another pivot point, which I'm going to call point Q, all right? So, Literally, you can pick any point on the board, and this will always work. Just so that the calculations don't get too crazy, I'm going to choose this point over here where Sally is sitting, and I'm going to call that point Q. Follow? All right, so let's find the net torque around point Q. So that should be the torque from Sally plus the torque from the fulcrum plus the torque from gravity on the board itself plus the torque from Roy, and solve it. Okay, so plug in our numbers. Let's see, our net torque is zero. The torque from Sally is 588 times zero. zero, because from point Q, her distance is zero. Torque from the fulcrum is 1568 times 1.5. Torque from gravity is 196 times 2, plus the torque from Roy is 784 times the distance from point Q. Follow? All right, so let's not make the same mistake I made last time. Let's put in our negatives, right? So let's see, the 588 is zero. Uh, torque from the fulcrum. 
torque from the fulcrum. Let's see. Notice where the pivot point is. My pivot point is here. The force at the fulcrum is upward, so that's counterclockwise. So that's a positive torque. How about the torque from gravity, you guys? That one's negative, and this is my unknown. You can, it gets really ugly, because then you have to express all of your other distances in terms of d. So you get like d, and 4 minus d, and 1.5 minus d, and it gets ugly. So that's actually the only bad choice. Okay. So it does work. It does work. Okay. okay. All right. Everybody good? All right. So if you solve this using your algebra, you end up getting that... Um, so you get 784 times the distance from point Q is negative 1960. And then solve it, and the distance from point Q ends up being 2.5 meters. Is it negative? Okay, so again, let's, what this negative is telling me is I need to produce clockwise torque, right? So if this is my pivot point and Roy's force is down, which direction from my pivot point do I need to be to produce clockwise torque? To the right, correct? Yeah. All right. Although now I'm nervous because I, oh, my answers don't match, do they? I got one meter before. I got two and a half meters this time. But it's from a different point. Do you guys agree that one meter from here is the same as two and a half meters from here? Ah, so it still gave me this, even though numerically my answer is different, it's still describing the same point on the board. So my final answer here is 2.5 meters to the right of Sally. Does that make sense, you guys? Questions? All right, what's the moral of the story? Why, why did I go through this garbage twice? What am I trying to show you? You can pick your pivot point wherever you want. So you need to be strategic about it, all right? So for my honors physics class, we've learned that there are two types of problems, all right? And it's not going to be true in this class because we're going to have more dimension story about here. But so for my honors class, there are two types of problems. There are problems where there are two unknown forces, and problems where there's an unknown force and an unknown distance. We just did unknown force, unknown distance, right? We found the unknown force uh, by using net force of zero, and then we solved for the distance, right? What do you think you do if there are two unknown forces? Uh, I mean, this technically was a system of equations. Adam? Good. If you have two unknown forces, Make one of them the pivot point. Why? Why is that useful? Because then it doesn't produce any torque and you can solve for the other one. Good? Does that make sense? All right. Now, here's the deal. Everything here was all along one dimension, right? That teeter-totter was horizontal. All of our forces were vertical. All right? This is AP. So we're up in the difficulty a little bit. All right? So, this we already went through. When an object is in equilibrium, net force is zero, net torque is zero. Again, I'm going to highlight the fact that you can use any pivot point. All right? Now, also, please remember, in that example, all of my forces were vertical, and my lever arm was horizontal, so all my angles were 90 degrees, right? Yeah. What do you have to do if the force is at a weird angle? Yeah, you got you to gotta do some trig, right? So real quick crash course reminder. So suppose I give you something like this, where you've got a wrench that's, you know, whatever, some distance long, and you push down on the end of the wrench with a force F. All right, so mathematically, you can do D times F times the sine of this angle, if you know it, okay? But sometimes you don't, all right? Ultimately, how do I want to say this? 
if I wanted to just do D times F and not worry about angles, what would I have to do first? Find a component, right? So there are two ways you can do it. So the I think the intuitive way to do it would be this, to say, all right, well, my distance, my lever arm is this vector, right? But really, all I care about is the perpendicular component of that, right? So I would find that length there and multiply it by the force, right? Uh, it, it is, yes, but you won't always be given this angle. You know what I mean? Like sometimes the problems are a little bit more complicated. Um, Um, so here's a problem I gave my honor students. All right, so when you pedal on a bike, what direction are you pushing always? Down, right? Unless there's clips on your, whatever. But in, on a simple bike, you're pushing down, right? Okay? So suppose the pedal is at a, at a point where the pedal is 30 degrees off of the horizontal. And then you push down. So my lever arm would be this, and my force is vertical. Notice, right now, I don't know this angle. Can you find it? Absolutely. OK? So there's a, sim a simple example of one. So when I solve this, I wouldn't worry about finding that. What I would do is I would find this horizontal component and multiply it by the force. Yes. Correct. All right, or another example, and we're going to do one like this in a minute, is this. Suppose you've got like a ladder leaning against a wall. All right, and maybe I tell you that this distance here is two meters and that this distance here is four meters, and I give you the mass of the ladder, and I want to figure out how much torque the ladder is producing around this pivot point. So there are two ways you could do it. Option one would be Drawing your force of gravity, find this angle, find this length, and then do Fg times d times sine theta. Or, if you know this force of gravity, you can solve this in one step. I'm going to not say anything. Think for a minute. Suppose we know this force of gravity. How do I find the torque produced by that force of gravity around this pivot point? You can do it one step. Anybody see it? What's your lever arm? Well, the lever arm, technically, technically speaking, your lever arm would be this whole thing, right? But we don't really care about that. What we care about is the part of that that is perpendicular to the force, which is one meter. Right? So it's force of gravity times one. Does that make sense? Because this is my lever arm because my force is vertical. Hello? Yep. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. So here's, Carly, do you see why, what I'm saying, why I'm like yeah. making this a point? Yeah. All right. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So where were we? I don't remember. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So we were talking about the fact that you need to find a way, if you've got weird angles, you need to find a way to deal with that. Okay. By either finding the component of the lever arm that's perpendicular, or finding the component of the force that's perpendicular, or finding the angle between the two vectors. Those are basically your three options. Clear? All right. So once you've got that, we can solve more complicated problems. So let's solve this thing. All right. So when I say solve this, I, I what I want to do is I want to find all the unknown forces. All right. So what we've got here is a beam, which we're going to assume is massless, to keep things simple. Okay, with a 400 newton weight hanging from one end. This end is attached to the wall by a little hinge. 
And then this, this is a rope that goes up and ties to the wall. Questions about just what is going on here? Yeah, Johnny. Is like the rope attached to the wood and the wood is also attached to the wood? Two separate ropes. Yes. Yeah, so there's this rope that is attached to the wall, and there's this rope which is attached to the waist. It's not just one. It, it wouldn't be. Yeah. So as soon as it's attached, you can treat them as separate ropes. Follow? So as soon as you tie a knot on there, it could be one rope, but as soon as there's a knot there, the tension at the top part might be different than the bottom. Does that help? All right, cool. So what we want to do is we want to find all of our unknown forces. So first of all, let's just list the forces. So somebody name a force. What do you got? Is that the force? Is that the force? You can break the components, but you have a force applied by the rod. The force applied by the rod on, on what? And I'm glad you said this because now I realize my question was worded badly. On the rope? OK. So let me rewind and let me phrase my question differently. What I said, we're trying to find our unknown forces. I should have been more specific. Let's find the unknown forces on the rod. The rod is the thing that's in equilibrium, right? It's the whole system. Well, I guess the whole system is. But we, in this, what I would like to focus on is the rod itself. OK? And I didn't make that clear, so that's on me, for sure. So what forces act on the rod? So give me one, Carla. Tension force from the rope connecting the rod to the wall. So this. So there's one force, force of tension. Okay, what else? Yeah. Gravity. Gravity on the rod. So I and I I said offhanded, I said let's assume the rod itself is massless. So but if it wasn't, then you would just assume, well, you'd have to know where the center of mass was and you'd have one more force there from its weight. Good? Yeah. Alright. So gravity of Gravity of the thing, right? Of the the weight of the weight. All right? So we can call this F G. Good? All right. What else? There's got to be at least one other force. How do, well, so first, so give me the other force and tell me how you know it has, that it's not zero. What do you got here? Oh, well, I'm not sure about this at all. But it's okay. Um, it's what it does, the, because it's two separate ropes, would there also be a force of tension like, between the rod and the... I gotcha. All right. So yeah. So I guess to be fair, this force here, the force of gravity actually acts on the weight. Right. But what has to be true about this tension force? Here. Forget about everything else. Just think about this 400 newton weight. Gravity's pulling it down with 400 newtons. Why isn't it falling? Because the tension's pulling it up, right? So technically, this force of gravity, I probably should have labeled it as another tension force. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to leave it like that, even though technically it's sloppy. Um, Patrick, I haven't heard from you today. What do you got? Normal force from the wall. Normal force from the wall. How do you know the wall has to be exerting a force? Say that again. Yeah. Do you guys agree that there's a horizontal component of this tension force? The rope is pulling the rod this way, right? Why doesn't it move that way? Because the wall's pushing back, right? So at the very least, we know there's a horizontal component from this little hingy thing over here. And there might be a vertical component. We don't know. Follow? All right. So we're actually going to have three equations that we need to solve. Net force vertically has to be zero. Net force horizontally needs to be zero. And what's the third one? Net torque has to be zero. Cool? So there's force. Do we want it? What do you, I don't, I'm going to call it hinge. Force of hinge in the x direction. And then, I don't know, the hinge might be pushing vertically. I don't know. Good? All right. So thoughts about where to start here on solving this thing? What we need to do is we need to pick one of those three equations. Here are the three equations we have to work with. We know that our net force horizontally has to be zero, which means these two horizontal components have to cancel out. We know our net force vertically has to be zero, which means that this downward force 
this upward force and whatever's going on over here, I'll have to add up to zero. And our net torque has to be zero, but that's kind of a nebulous, I just said nebulous, I'm going to stick with it, nebulous statement because I haven't chosen a pivot point yet. All right, so first of all, let's look at these top two equations. If you can, those top two equations are easier, but I don't think either of them help me right now. Do you guys see why neither one helps? This top equation has two unknowns because I don't know this horizontal component and I don't know this horizontal component. And this equation doesn't help me because I have three possibly vertical forces and I only know one of them, right? So both of these equations give me two unknowns. You always want to find one equation that has one unknown, right? Or you have these systems which you should never have to do, okay? All right, so can anybody find a way to use this net torque equals zero equation to make some progress? We got to, anytime we say net torque equals zero, what should your first question be? Where is your pivot point? So you got an idea, Dan? Yeah, well, since FA hinge, we don't know what FA tax or FA fly is. If we choose that their yeah, pivot point, those will both don't produce any torque, so those will be wrong. Perfect. Did everybody hear what he just said? He just said, if I choose my pivot point to be right here, then those two unknown forces there don't produce any torque. So when I write my net torque equation about that pivot point, how many unknown forces are there going to be? Just one, right? Because there are only two forces creating torque about this pivot point, right? The weight and the tension. Follow? Yeah. All right. So we are totally out of time here. Um, so here's what I would like you to do. See if you can, and uh, this is homework. I'm going to actually check it. I know sometimes I do this, and I don't check it. So I know you've got the test tomorrow. Your only homework tomorrow night after the test is to see if you can pick up where Daniel left us, find this tension force, and then find the hinge forces. All right? We'll do one more example, and then you'll have most of the hour Thursday to work. Okay? Okie doke. I'm around after school today if you need me.